let's kick off the questions. And our first question comes from Kingston, Ontario, by phone. Hello, my name is Jeff McKay. I've noticed when I enjoy a gin and tonic in a tall glass, that's extra tonic water, you understand, the lemon pips will rise from the bottom of the glass fairly slowly to the top and then drop to the bottom again. This will go on and on as long as there is liquid to rise in. To verify the results with scientific method as reproducible, I repeat the experiment several times, but I find my records seem to get illegible after the second or third trial. I'd like to understand what's going on behind this phenomenon. Really, I'm stumped. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that super deep scientific question here to start us off. Why do lemon pips constantly rise up and fall down in my gin and tonic? Well, the uh, Science Center doesn't have a bar here, so we can't do the experiment for you live. But here to help us answer why pips rise and fall in our gin and tonic is Dr. Kathy Foxaninato. She's an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biomecular Sciences at the University of Ottawa. Hi, welcome to Quirks and Quarks. Hi, Bob. Have you seen this phenomenon yourself? Um, perhaps not in the gin and tonic, but maybe in a rum and coke. Okay. <laughs> so, what's going on? What would make sort of lemon seeds go up and down in, in a gin and tonic? Well, for all of the carbonated beverages that are like soft drinks, uh, everyone knows that it contains dissolved carbon dioxide gas, right? And that gas has been added at high pressure but that means that the carbonated gas has to eventually bubble out of that particular beverage. So what's happening is that the rough or uneven surface of the seed provides what we would call nucleation sites. So those are sites at which the carbon dioxide molecules can begin to collect and start to form a bubble. So those are the bubbles that you see, even if there, there aren't pips, the bubbles that are on the sides of the glass and all that? Exactly. They're because of little imperfections. Exactly, so it turns out the, the the nucleation process is a lot easier on a rough or uneven surface, like where you would get irregularities, like on the surface of a peel or a seed, which is a lot easier to do than on the smooth surface, like on the inside of a glass. Okay, so these little seeds, they collect bubbles. Right. And then they rise to the top? Exactly. So as more and more carbon dioxide molecules join the bubble, the bubble begins to grow, and it acts as a flotation device for the seed, and the seed begins to rise up. Okay. But of course, eventually, that bubble will either dislodge from the surface of the seed, or the seed reaches the surface, the bubble pops, and now your seed has lost its, its life jacket, and the seed will begin to fall and start the whole process all over again. So it just keeps going up and down like that. And so will, the process will repeat over and over until either your beverage goes flat, meaning all the di carbon dioxide gas has bubbled away, or you finished your beverage, whichever comes first. <laughs> Does this work with any carbonated drink? It should with any carbonated be beverage, but I actually tried to replicate it myself in the green room. Really, you have to get the density just right. You need to have a co combination of the alcohol and the carbonated beverage to get the density just right for the seed to actually rise and fall in the glass. Uh, um, in just plain carbonated beverage, there's so much carbonation, so many bubbles are coming up that the seed rises and then just sort of stays at the surface as all that carbon dioxide continuously off-gasses from the beverage. Oh, I see. So you're telling me that the alcohol makes the seed fall yeah. down. You need to have you, <laughs> you need to have some gin in that gin and tonic. <laughs> Dr. Paxignano, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Our next question comes from one of the youngest curious minds who is here tonight, eight year old uh, Arlo Ald from Ottawa. Do you have a question? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Arlo. I'm eight years old. Why is it that we associate some colors with specific emotions? Is that an association made in our brain? Or is it learned through our culture? Wow, you're eight years old. <laughs> Thank you, Arlo. So, 
So why do we associate some colors with specific emotions and others that come from our brain or do they come from our culture? Well, for the answer to Arlo's question is Dr. Nafisa Ishmael. She's an associate professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa. Hi, welcome to our program. Thank you, Bob. All right, let's begin with a few associations here. What are sort of the, some of the common associations with emotion and color? So, as you said, some of the color preferences come from culture and some through learned experiences. So as we um, encounter situations in our daily life, we have memories that are formed. Some of these memories are, have emotions associated with them. Um, there is color present in the environment and then there is an emotion color association that takes place. Well, can you give uh, me some examples? What are some of the examples of colors and emotions? Okay, so for example, we have black in the Western culture that's often associated with sadness, mourning. Um, and we have red that is usually associated with Valentine's Day. So there is a lot of various uh, color preferences and, and colors associated with emotions that come from the culture where we live in that changes from an individual across the lifespan and it will vary from one individual to another. Halloween is usually associated with orange. So usually when we think of orange, we think of pumpkin, we think of Halloween. Depending on whether we like or not Halloween, an emotion will be elicited. And so that's how we get the association between color and emotion. But we can also say I'm, I'm red with anger. I mean, a, a red, red, or I'm blue, I'm blue. blue. Um, so before, before the cultural part of this, where we learn that, like Halloween is orange, yeah. how much of it is natural? When does this begin? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we are naturally born with this instinct to identify what's danger and what's safety and secure. So it's natural for individuals to be attracted to what's safe, what's secure, and avoid what's danger. That elicits emotions. As we're babies, we can't see very well. Our visual acuity is very, very low. And so, but as we age, develop through the months, our vision gets better, and babies are naturally attracted to bright colors because they like them a lot, um, and they can see them whereas dull colors are more difficult to see for babies. But this preference will change throughout the lifespan. So naturally in our cultures, we like to present baby girls with pink, baby boys with blue. So we are kind of enforcing this preference, but eventually that changes as the individual ages and experiences situation in their environment. So where do you think the balance is then between brain, which might say red is danger because red is blood, and culture? All that Halloween is orange. What, what, what yeah. do you think the balance? Well, it will, yes, it will vary um, across the lifespan, but from one individual to another, too. So while for one, red might represent anger, fire, danger, something that has to be avoided, for someone else, red might represent uh, flowers, roses, uh, hearts. And so it, it's very different from one individual to another, and there's huge differences between cultures as well. A little bit of both. Dr. Ishmael, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, all you Facebook, Facebook folks out there, uh, we're not ignoring you. Uh, keep your questions coming, especially if they're related to space, technology, climate change, the environment, evolution, and health, because that's what the experts that we have here tonight are good at. Okay. And uh, keep the questions in our comments page on our webpage, and that will make you happy. Okay, for our next question, we're going to take a travel back 50 years to the year 1967. Hi, I'm Kerry Foster, and my question is, if a time traveler left a 2017 cell phone in 1967, how much could 1967 technology actually retrieve from the phone? Wow, thank you, Kerry, for that question. By the way, 1967 was the year that this science center, Museum of Science and Technology, opened in Canada. It was a centennial project. And I don't know if any of you remember Expo 67. I sort of certainly went that. It was great. So, if someone from 2017 left their cell phone back in 1967, how much would they know, could they even turn it on? <laughs> so, 
Here to answer that, Kerry's question, is Dr. Abdumalatem El Sadiq, a professor in the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University Research Chair at the University of Ottawa. Dr. El Sadiq, welcome to our program. Thank you, Bob. Thank so, you for everything. So, 1967, I was alive then. Could, could they even turn a cell phone on if they sort of just found one sitting on a desk? Well, 1967, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> Thanks. No, let's make it. I, in 2007, I gave my grandma the first iPhone, and she didn't know what to do with it. Yet, if I bring it back to 1967, so we, we would be able to extract some information, yes, indeed. So first of all, who among you used a touch screen or was able to use a touch screen 10 years back? Right. Few. So, there, so there was no touch screen? So that, th that's what many people might think of. The first paper, research paper on touch screen was published in 1964 or 65, a capacitive touch screen. So basically, we would be able to interact with it a bit. Now, uh, how much information uh, we can extract? So textual information are usually simple to extract. Compression techniques. So we have how many images you have on your cell phone? Thousands. You know that the biggest, oh, that time, the IBM machine that was able to store, was able to store around 125 gigabyte. Wow. And the machine was as big as my fridge at home. <laughs> well, so that's, now, a, that's a good question. Like uh, the amount of information that's in a cell phone today, how, how big would the computers have been back then? Yeah, so basically for my 128 gigab uh, gigabytes that everyone has today, the iPhone or the Samsung or whatever, we would, ha we would need probably 8,000 fridge size machines 8, to, store, fridges. to store them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's, they, they would figure out maybe this thing's really dense, but could they get the functions of it? Would they understand things like it's talking to satellites, GPS, so, so. knows where you are, can network with the world, wireless communication? So they will start clicking the applications. All those applications that require the internet connections that we use today, they wouldn't be able to function because it's not there. However, if they click by hazard or after a couple of um, trial, trial and error on the images, they will be able to see the images. Now, how we extract those information, simplest answer would be, take an analog uh, camera from that time and take a picture of that. <laughs> but in 1967, the internet did not exist. No. Wireless it, communication did not. The phone was something attached to the wall with a wire that you had to stand beside it, and all it could do was call. And you need, and you and need you to use dial. your finger to dial, right? Yes. I know. So, yes, yeah, so as I said, so some science scientists might be able to extract some of those information. Uh, the images in the format that exists today, so we use JPEG, everybody here is aware of JPEG, was only uh, it's standardized in the 90s. MPEG in late, uh, later, a couple of years later, so we all use videos in MPEG or H.264, MPEG-4, so those, wow. those compression techniques were not there yet. However, let me add one thing, so Bob, if I would have find a phone in 1967, probably the technology would have uh, advanced much faster than we know today. Due to reverse engineering, right? So people who are, who were smart that time, as smart as we are today. So they would be able to reverse engineer and probably I wouldn't be uh, talking to you today, but my avatar, my, myself, me, will be sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you think is going to happen? Would we be better equipped today in 2017 to figure out a, a phone from 50 years from now? I think that I personally, I believe there is no limit for human intelligence. And when people are in front of something new to discover, they will find a way to interact with it. I have full respect to the human intelligence. Dr. El Sadiq, thank you very much. <laughs> and our next questioner is here tonight. Chloe Cook is right here from Ottawa. Chloe. Hi, my name is Chloe Cook. Almost 100% of ash trees population has been attacked by the invasive emerald ash bear. 
Will the areas affected eventually become unsuitable habitats for these insects due to lack of the ash trees? If so, is there hope that ash trees might be reintroduced once the frontier production is suitably distant? Thank you very much, Chloe. So what happens to the emerald ash borer when it doesn't have any more trees to attack, basically? Can the trees, the ash trees, ever come back? And here with the answer is Dr. Don Hall, the Exhibition Interpretation Officer and Science Advisor right here at the museum. Dr. Hall, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bob. OK, so um, first of all, tell me about the emerald ash borer. Uh, where did it come from, and how much damage has it done so far? Um, it's a, a type of beetle. And it's originally, it's uh, native to Asia. So China, Japan, Eastern Russia. Uh, it arrived here in the, probably the early 90s, but it wasn't detected until about 2002. How'd it get here? Uh, probably on wood packaging materials. Wow, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So importing materials, the, the, the beetles within the wood. Yep, in the wood. The environment. And then so, they got here okay, near so the trees. What's it, what's it done to the ash trees? It's pretty much decimated the populations anywhere that it's close to. So um, in the northeastern U.S. And, and in Canada and Ontario and parts of Quebec, essentially the ash borer cuts off the nutrients from photosynthesis coming down and the water from the roots coming up by its larva eating the tissue that is between the wood of the tree and the bark on the outside. Oh, that's, that's the living part of the tree, just underneath the bark? Yeah. That, that's what they attack. Okay, so the question is, Chloe's question is, after they do that, after they kill all the trees, what do the beetles do? So it's really a little bit more complicated than that. I talked to Dr. Krista Ryle from uh, Natural Resources Canada to, to kind of get a bit of the frontline research that's happening today. And uh, they did a study on an area that was near Windsor, Ontario, where the original outbreak was. And so they found that even though almost 100% of the mature ash trees were gone, there were still emerald ash borers present. And so they were living in the saplings, things as small as 2.5 centimeters in diameter of these re-sprouts coming from the cut down trees or from seedlings coming up from the seed of the ash. Or they actually, in 2015, somebody found this type, the emerald ash borers, on a different type of tree. It's called white fringe tree. Oh, so they can move to another species. They think that they can, and they've seen, they don't have quite as much success as on ash, but it does seem like there is another type of tree, this white fringe tree. It's a, it's a relative of ash tree, but it does seem like uh, emerald ash borer can survive. They're really, really good at finding hosts. Boy, so does that mean then that the ash trees could not be reintroduced? Um, it means that they might have to be re reintroduced or they might change forms. So they seem to re-sprout really easily. So even though they could be killed at a large tree form or once they get to a certain size, they could come back really quickly and turn into more of a shrub than a full tree. The other piece of the puzzle is that there could be uh, resistance. So different types of trees have different types of resistance. And blue ash is a variety of ash uh, that has shown a little bit of resistance and is native to parts of North America. There's also Manchurian ash, which co-evolved with the emerald ash borer in China. And uh, that actually has some more resistance and can survive. How could we get rid of them? Well, that's a, another great question. <laughs> um, so researchers uh, in Canada and the US right now are working on maybe not getting rid of them, but trying to reduce the population to a level that would still allow the trees to survive. So there's um, pathogenic fungus, so fungus that infects these ash borers that could kill them. But then there's also parasitic wasps. So in China, there's these little tiny wasps, smaller than ants, that attack only emerald ash borers. They don't bite or sting humans, they would just attack these bugs. And so these researchers in Canada um, are trying to work towards bringing those in that would allow these wasps to attack the emerald ash borer to keep the population low to give the trees a fighting chance to survive. Okay, so we have a problem with an invasive species of insect, and we're going to bring in another invasive species to take care of them. Yes, they've done a lot of policy research into this, and they've really looked long and hard at this option before bringing them in. So I think really it was a question about making sure that it is the only thing that it attacks. It doesn't attack any other native insects around here, and it doesn't have an impact on humans or any other animals. Dr. Hall, thank you very much. Thank you.
Well, as we approach the halfway mark in the show, we're getting close to the part of the show where our experts will answer those Facebook questions, so do keep them coming. Now, we're giving priority to questions about space, technology, climate change, the environment, evolution, and health, because those are the topics our guests today are well versed in. Write those questions in the comments, and please stay tuned. Our next question comes on the phone from Oakville, Ontario. Hello, my name is Robert Gillespie, and my question is, what is the evolutionary advantage in Homo sapiens becoming essentially hairless when compared with all other primates? Ah, okay, so what was the evolutionary advantage for Homo sapiens becoming essentially hairless when compared to all other primates? So here with the answer. To Robert's question is Dr. Andrew Simmons, a professor in the Department of Biology at Carleton University. Hi, welcome to Quirks and Quarks. Thanks very much, Bob. Okay, so when did Homo sapiens, or I guess we should say our, our human ancestors, going back however long, first become hairless? Well, it depends on which uh, hypothesis you actually uh, actually believe. There, there are a number of different hypotheses for the loss of hair in, uh, in the human line. Um, the one that's most plausible, it seems, the one with the most evidence, and isn't just a, a just so story, because there are quite a few of those, um, would put it around 1.6 to 1.2 million years ago, so quite a long time ago. And it looked like, uh, and so this, is, this hypothesis, I might as well say, um, is known as the keep cool hypothesis or the, or the sweating hypothesis. So <laughs> it, uh, that there was, um, uh, the human ancestors were, were uh, at that point, or prior to that, to that point, eating seeds and a lot of vegetation. And with uh, climate change, there was climate change then, and it was the beginning of the Pleistocene around 2.5 million years ago, um, they uh, were forced to change their lifestyle dramatically and become much more active. And in fact, that's when meat was introduced into the, into the diet, so hunting as well. Okay. And, and so they had to uh, sweat to, uh, to avoid um, uh, heat damage basically to, to tissue, especially our brain, which was becoming larger than our brain, I'm talking about. But, um, okay, so, yeah. so there was a, a change in climate and a change in diet, but why does being hairless provide an advantage? What's the evolutionary advantage to that? Right, so it would be impossible to lose heat um, quickly enough and efficiently enough with hair. We also have a huge number, unlike other mammals, a huge number of, of eccrine glands. They're sweat glands that are right on the surface of our skin. Um, other mammals have, uh, they do have some eccrine glands, but most of their sweat glands are associated with hair follicles, and it's not very efficient to lose heat by uh, evaporation um, at a distance from your body. So we lose it directly off, uh, off our skin. Okay. So we are sweat masters. Exactly, yeah, we're, we are experts at sweating. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, we still, though, have some hair left. What about that? Why aren't we totally hairless? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, you know, some of these um, hypotheses are just that. They're, they're just so stories. But I mean, when humans um, became uh, was bipedal, standing on, on, on two legs, um, the, the surface that is facing the sun is, is the head. So um, most mammals have fur, uh, and part of the adaptive advantage of having fur is to protect from UV radiation. Sunscreen. Sunscreen, yeah. yeah. A okay. lot of them don't have that, yeah. We have well. hair in other places that's not on our head as well. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, so, so underarm hair, groin hair, um, that seems to function as, um, uh, Obviously, those are the, the joints that move when you're, when you're walking, when you're running, um, and so uh, they are better lubricated um, with the hair, oh, okay. with the hair there. And there are also some pheromones that are um, uh, emitted from, to, from those areas. To make them more interesting. That's right, the communication, the chemical side. communication, that's right. Right. Yeah. Okay, so if, uh, if our human ancestors and we became hairless, what about other primates that are still around that are even more distantly related to us, like chimps and gorillas? They still have hair. Yeah, they do, and that's a good question. You know, what is it about the particular circumstances that, that the, the hominid, uh, our hominid ancestors were in that made them different? And um, we do know that, um, that uh, a lot of the, the, 
the um, uh, primates now are very constrained in terms of how far they can move in a day. They have to remain near water sources uh, because of the inefficiency of, of sweating. Basically, to, to lose the same amount of heat in a particular time period, they have to consume masses amount of water. Um, so they are very constrained in terms of the amount of time they can spend active during the day. I've actually had the privilege of seeing the gorillas in, um, in, in Africa, the, the ones that Jane Fossey, the mist gorillas, and it's quite an interesting experience because they're vegetarian and they sit in their food. You have to go into the jungle and you've got to go through the bush and then you just come across a family a family with this big male sitting there, the alpha male, who's about as tall as I am, sitting. But he was just sitting there with his arms folded in front of him with a disgruntled look on his face. Looked towards me and went, <clears throat> then looked away. But they were just reaching for the food and not really moving very much. I was really surprised they were, they were constrained to that area. So they, that's partly why they're covered in hair, because they don't move. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that is part of the, of the hypothesis, yes. yes. Okay, and we just go in there and, or I guess <laughs> maybe the gorilla would just say, hey, no sweat. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dr. Simmons, thank you very much. <laughs>
and stretch them out to macro scales where you now have an energy density that's hotter in some places and cooler in some other places. So are you saying that the early universe was imperfect? <laughs> it, it, yes. it had flaws in it, it had little, these fluctuations in it. Absolutely. And that's Warm. what became stars and planets and galaxies and people. That creates denser regions, which eventually gravity takes over in and pulls everything together and uh, makes stars, people, and you and me. <laughs> okay, so it was fluctuations at the very beginning. Where did they come from? That is, that's a fantastic question. And that is because of something called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Um, Which means you don't know. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Good. I like it when scientists say we don't know. That's okay. That's okay. There is a, a quick analogy we can do for Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Imagine a bowl, um, and, you, and you have a marble, and you drop the, the marble in the bowl. Eventually, it'll come to rest at the bottom of the bowl after it stopped moving. Um, in the quantum world, that doesn't happen. In the quantum world, um, something can't have an exact position and an exact velocity at the same time. So if you drop a quantum particle into a potential well, it won't hit the bottom. It'll just bounce around the bottom a little bit. And that's a, a way of thinking of these fluctuations. Okay, so there are all these fluctuations. Now, Greg's question, though, is talking about now the universe is really spread out. And it's, it's, it's empty, so how do you get enough matter to make stars and planets? Well, what happens is uh, when you have that locked in hotter and colder bits, that's where the particles condense out as the universe keeps expanding. And then you get to a point where you have a whole bunch of particles in one spot, not as many particles in, in the other side, in other places in the universe, and gravity takes over. And it's really just gravity wins on those scales. Ah, gravity always manages to pull stuff together. And so that's, that's what it does. And it's that's gonna it. work more where these fluctuations were than in other places where it wasn't. So you get empty space, then you get clumps. Is that, is that's that what you're saying? That's the whole thing. That's it. It's crazy. It's nuts. <laughs> but it still comes down, I find it fascinating that we are here because the early universe had flaws in it. We're all flawed. If it, if it was perfect, we wouldn't be here. Isn't that nice? <laughs> We're not perfect. I Take like a load that off. idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dr. Rogerson, thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope that all of you watching online now are enjoying this show. Not everyone can make it to Ottawa for this event, but that doesn't mean you can't participate. Write a question in the comments section on our webpage. It's near the top of the hour. We'll do our best to answer as many as we can. And just a reminder, if you want a question answered, you stand a better chance if it's about space, technology, climate change, the environment, evolution, and health. What's left after all? Our next question comes from North Vancouver. Hi, my name is Valerie Coles and I live in North Vancouver. My question is, what exactly is chronic pain? I have it, myofascial pain in the tissues in my glute. Even doctors can't explain chronic pain, which research tells me is a never-ending misfiring of the nervous system and the brain's pain receptors. But no one knows exactly what causes it as it's not injury-related, so it remains unexplained. What exactly is chronic pain? And I'm sure a lot of us in the room can relate to that, especially those of us who dye our hair gray like I do. <laughs> Here to answer Valerie's question is Dr. Michael Hildebrand, an assistant professor at Carleton University and an affiliate investigator at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Dr. Hildebrand, welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Bob. Okay, I think all of us know about pain, regular pain. You touch something hot, ouch, you take your hand away and you say, I'm not gonna do that anymore, which is a good thing, right? Yes. <laughs> we need that. Yes. That's everyday pain. What is chronic pain? So in contrast to that good pain, chronic pain is no longer adaptive. It's a bad form of pain, obviously. So this is pain that persists for months, for months, or sorry, for months or even years after that trigger injury or disease has, has potentially resolved. So it, in a way, chronic pain can actually become a disease itself. Well, what's actually causing it? So it can be caused by many different mechanisms, but the, the kind of unifying thing is that we have these pain pathways that connect the receptors throughout our body, the pain receptors, to the, ba to the brain that ultimately encodes the pain. And so nerve cells called neurons in this pathway can lose their, their control on excitability. 
so that they start firing more in response to pain signals, or sometimes they even fire without without the pain inputs. Really? So yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. your your pain receptors can be sending a signal to your brain yeah. that you're in pain when there's really no injury. Exactly. So it's spontaneous pain that has no. It's, it's not in response to any environmental stimuli, but it's obviously there and it's very real. Wow. Yeah. Now, there are others though, like, uh, well, <laughs> take it personally, my knees bother me all the time. They always yes. have. So what's, what's going on there? I can feel the weather changing in my knees. So there could be different things, but there's different ways to kind of cause that loss of balance. And one, one main mechanism is inflammation. So in your knees, it could be, there could be kind of a persistent inflammation that releases these various types of chemicals that sensitize this pathway and cause this, this constant firing. Or it could be damage potentially. You can have damage to those nerve cells so that, so that even in the absence, they, they continue to send that, those right. extra, that extra information. Why is chronic pain so hard to deal with? It seems chronic, <laughs> so many people have yeah. it. I think partly because so many different processes can feed into it. So it's even though we think of it as one thing, it actually can be many different syndromes. And the other main thing is just that we have drugs that work really well for, for the, the good pain, the acute pain, to block that. But chronic pain, the drugs don't work as well, partly because of the time that's needed to constantly treat this. And, to try, and so to block that bad pain without affecting nervous system functions like higher brain functions that we need. And so, wow. yeah. so what's the best way to treat it? Identifying new targets to help turn down that excitability. So, so some of the, the newest research is trying to look at how to selectively restore that balance and excitability. And so some of the, we have some kind of new candidates and new targets and new approaches that hopefully one day we'll, we'll make it to the clinic. What about medical marijuana? That's obviously uh, definitely of pertinent uh, to, to, to today and, and the issues of today. And I think it's one tool that potentially can be used, yes, in certain syndromes. I think we're, we're starting to really try to tease apart what it would be doing and where it would be acting to work for pain and which, which forms it would work for. Dr. Hildebrand, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And here's another question from right here in Ottawa. Where, oh, hi, here you are. Good evening, uh, I'm John O'Quinn. Um, while not a disbeliever in global warming, I've never heard a good explanation of how we melted out from the last ice age or the many ice ages before that, long before human activity contributed to climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. So how did we go from melting out of the last ice age to present day global warming? And here with the answer to John's question is Dr. Derek Mueller, an assistant professor in the School of Geography and Environmental Studies at Carleton University. Dr. Mueller, welcome to Quirks and Quarks. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get a time scale here. What time frame are we talking about from the last ice age to today? Yeah, so the, the last glacial maximum, when, when the glaciers were really stretched out to their maximum extent, and even over this building, a kilometer, maybe more of ice was, was above our heads, if you can imagine that. And it was cold. It was uh, six, seven, eight uh, degrees colder than it is today. Wow. So That's so about uh, 21,000 years ago. 21,000 years ago. Yeah. So what was the world like then? Well, cold and dry yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and covered in ice. <laughs> well, but how, how extensive was the ice around the planet? Like, if you could see the Earth from space. Yeah, well, the, the ice covered almost all of Canada. So, and, and in the Northern Hemisphere, the, you know, the, you have the same ice sheets coming down over, over Northern Russia and that sort of thing. So, yeah, okay. quite a bit. A third of the Northern Hemisphere would have been covered a in ice. A third of the Northern Hemisphere. That, yeah. And what about the Southern Hemisphere? Uh, well, uh, there would have been more ice there too, but um, the center of ice in the in the southern hemisphere is Antarctica, and so uh, it's harder for ice to, to pour over the ocean and extend out, right? So it, those ice caps would have would have grown from the Andes and from other mountains right. uh, uh, in the in the southern hemisphere. Because the southern hemisphere of the Earth is mostly ocean. It's, yeah, it, yeah. It's interesting. A... It's interesting if you turn a, a map of the world upside down. I saw one of these in Australia. They, they have a map of the world from their point of view, and Australia's in the middle, and all North America's at the bottom. But it's interesting because it's all water. And you just see these, these fingers sticking up. There's South America sticking up, Africa sticking up, and India sticking up, but the rest of it's all water. 
so they didn't get as much ice. There's okay. a lot of water, yeah. So we have the ice up here in the north, two kilometers deep in Ottawa. That's hard to believe. What happened from then till now? Take me through the sequence of well, events. Well, so I, I, around that time, there was a, a, a subtle shift. There's a, there's a cycle of um, where, where the orbit of Earth changes just sun, uh, slightly. And there was more sunlight received in the northern hemisphere further to the north. So in, uh, say, about 65 degrees north, somewhere around Yellowknife, Northwest Territories in that area. And that extra sunlight came in the summer. And so that, even if it was a subtle change, it was enough to change the balance and tip the scales. And so it started the melting process. And then the, the melting process really got going at about 15,000 years ago. So you're saying that the ice, the warming of the ice age was triggered by the, the relationship between the Earth's tilt and the sun? That that, yeah, that so there's, there's the, the Earth's tilt, there's the precession, which is how the Earth so, um, spins, but it, it wobbles a little like a top. It's around like a top, yeah. Yeah, so we're looking at Polaris as our North Star, but it'll end up being Vega at some point yeah. in thousands okay. of years from now. and that, that influences, and there's also the, the shape of the orbit, how circular versus elliptical it is. And okay. we're talking very, very small changes. But enough to warm the Earth. So, so then take me through the warming. How did it, how did it proceed? So it, it started slowly, and then it gathers momentum, and then at about 15,000 years ago, it's, it's going full tilt, and then uh, glaciers were about uh, what they are today at about 6,000 years ago. And uh, since then, we've been, we've been actually gradually cooling um, from about six, eight to 6,000 uh, years ago was a very warm period, and it starts to cool very slowly over time. Really? It's been cooling? It, that, it has been until, of course... Well, until we came along, right? Until we came along, <laughs> exactly. But uh, was the, the warming that happened, was it nice and smooth, or were there, were there blips in that? Along uh, the well, yeah, so it happened exceedingly rapidly but it wasn't a, a smooth transition. There was, there was um, meltwater, so that you imagine the, the, the glaciers melting and all of its water has to go somewhere, and it piled up in lakes on land, and then at some point, these lakes burst out into the ocean, and uh, in some cases, they actually slowed down the warning for, for, a, for a period of time. So it, it disrupts ocean circulation, which is also a big part of our climate, and that then, especially in the North Atlantic, for instance, it brought the temperature right back down to near glacial conditions. Boy. But then it rebounded after that. Okay, so that's, that's the general trend. You say it was getting warmer and now we should be getting colder, or we do for another ice age, is that? Yeah, like maybe in a couple thousand years or something, okay. you would think, but, <laughs> but uh, with, with human influence, uh, that's not in the cards anymore. Okay, so we... Yeah. We prevented what should be another ice age coming. We're co actually causing it to get warmer with greenhouse gases. Right, because those cycles that, that we're talking about are happening naturally. And so they, they go on a sort of a, for instance, the last eight uh, or, or more ice ages, they happen every 100,000 years because of these orbital changes. And, um, and before that, they happen at regularly as well, but at a, little, at a faster pace at about 40,000 uh, years. Eight? Eight ice ages we've At had. least, and yeah, there are more than that, in fact, yeah. Wow. And so the, the cycle continues. It takes 80,000 years for the glaciers to build up to the, to the extent I mentioned, and then 10,000 years to disappear, uh, to come back to this, this kind of a, a climate. Boy. Okay, so have we broken that cycle then? Well, at least for the foreseeable several thousand years, yes, because of um, our putting in 40% more CO2 than was there before the Industrial Revolution. So, so what's your, the, all what's of the your greenhouse gases that we've put in have raised temperatures uh, about almost a, a degree Celsius. And there's more to come, obviously. There's more to come from the, the CO2 we've put in uh, just up till now, but there's also um, what we need to slow down and stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere so that we can level off at some point. Do you think we can do that? I'm very optimistic we can, but we need to act soon. Absolutely. Dr. Mueller, thank essence. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we are approaching our last two questions from the floor here in Ottawa before we open it up to our Facebook audience. There's still time for you online folks to write your questions in our comments section. And given the knowledge of our experts today, focus your questions on space, technology, climate change, the environment, evolution, and health. 
Our next question is one that many people have about blindness, coming from a man who is legally blind himself. And um, I didn't check off any of the boxes that you mentioned. You're making me look bad. <laughs> um, but anyway, my question was about uh, being born totally blind and never having sight in all of your life. What do you dream? Thank you for that, Norman. Now, Norman is legally blind, which means that he can get some information in. But what if someone who has been blind, totally blind from birth, what are their dreams like? And here to answer Norman's question is Leah Turner. Leah's a fourth year student in Carleton University's Cognitive Science Program. Welcome to Quirks and Quarks. Thank you for having me. So, how is it that people who are blind from Earth are able to dream without ever having any visual reference? Right, well I think a good way for us to kind of understand that is to do a little quick mental experiment. And we're gonna do this in our minds so we don't injure each other. Um, so imagine what the behind your head looks like. Not the color of your hair or where it is in space, but try to picture what that looks like in your mind. Now, compare that to trying to picture your full environment in your visual field. Even though it's blurry on the sides, you still would have some visual reference of um, where you are in the environment. So now imagine with those two pictures in mind that you raise your arms out to the side of your visual field and hold your arms just inside of your visual field. You would still have a view of your arms even though you aren't directly looking at them. You have a sense of reference. But if you moved your arms just behind your visual field, then what would your arms look like? Well, it still looks the same. There's still the same physical properties. But if you try and imagine what that might look like, it's not that it's black or it's white or it's colored, it's just that it's not. So really, um, when you think about the visual reference that a congenitally blind individual would have, is it's not black or it's not you know colored, it's just not there at all. Um, so does that mean then that when a, a totally blind person dreams that it's their other senses that take over? Exactly, exactly. So. Um, we have, all of us, sighted or not, have a varying degree of sensory input. Um, and congenitally blind individuals actually can develop other senses past what uh, sighted individuals would have. Um, so that would enter our, our dreamscape as well, depending on um, how intense your perceptual experience was and how that could come up in your kind of dream space. So their dreams then would still have all the reality that our dreams do, but just different input. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Different input. What about bizarre dreams? Like right. Sometimes we have really weird dreams or even nightmares sometimes. Right. So first off, bizarre dreams don't always have to be nightmares. I think there's a distinction there. Um, there's a range of different emotions that can accompany a bizarre dream. Um, but for congenitally blind individuals, it would have to be kind of an overactivation of um, another sensory experience that would be significant enough to show up in your dreams. So for example, something that sighted individuals would really not have is um, an experience of echolocation. That's a possible um, sense that ha could be developed by congenitally blind individuals that couldn't easily have been developed by sighted people. Um, so the bizarreness doesn't just come from the nature and what they're dreaming about uh, contextually. It, it comes from the nature of the senses and how they present themselves in your dreams as well. So um, there was a study that was conducted on this to see exactly what was showing up. And it was conducted in the brain lab um, in Copenhagen. And there were 11 congenitally blind individuals. And the researchers asked the individuals to report um, what they dreamt about every night for four weeks straight. Right in the morning, they would fill in a questionnaire. And 18% of the congenitally blind individuals reported that they had um, taste sensations in their dreams, which is something that you know, sighted people wouldn't normally have. And up to 30% had olfactory sensations in their dreams, which is the sense of smell. So that really varies as well. 
Well, it's interesting you mentioned echolocation. We talked about that on Quirks recently, about how some people can be like bats and send out a, a signal. They, they make a sound, I can't do it very well, but it's sort of like and they can tell by the echo where it is. And I met a, um, a blind individual who uh, rattled his keys in his pocket as he walked along. And the jingling of the keys would reflect off the wall. And he actually took me around. We were at the CNIB in Toronto, Canadian National Institute for the Blind. And he took me from one building to another without a cane. And we were going between cars in a parking lot. And he wasn't walking slowly, and he wasn't touching the cars. <laughs> we got to the other side, I said, how did you do that? Can you really see? And he said, no, I'm as blind as a bat. <laughs> but he said, I rattle my keys, and I can see. I can see, I can tell where the cars are. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing how we can compensate mm -hmm. without vision and still be part of the real world. Right, exactly. Yes, Leah, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you for having me. Our next question comes from Alberta. Hello, my name is Lois Keln. I live in Red Deer, Alberta. And I've been wondering about this for a while. Electric cars are supposed to be without carbon emissions, but wouldn't that depend on the source of the electricity? We don't produce enough solar, hydro, or wind electricity at this time, so most would come from natural gas or coal, both carbon sources. Shouldn't this be taken into account when reporting on actual carbon emissions from electric cars? Thank you very much, Lois, for that question. How can electric cars be without carbon emissions if the source of electricity is a carbon source? With the answer to Lois's question here is Dr. Mika Errol Kantarchi. Kantarchi. An assistant professor in the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Ottawa. Welcome to Quirks and Quarks. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Now, so we tend to think of electric vehicles as being free from carbon emissions, which they themselves are, but is that true? Well, that's debatable, uh, and I think the question is uh, correct in asking uh, whether it depends on the source of electricity. Yes, perfectly true. Uh, it depends on the source of electricity. In Alberta, um, I think it was 2015 data that they had only 9% renewable penetration in their generation mix, uh, which is quite low than Ontario. For example, if we were to charge an electric vehicle in Ontario with our resources of hydro and nuclear, uh, we would cause much less carbon emissions with the same electric vehicle that's being charged in Alberta or, let's say, Texas. So it depends on where in the world you live exactly. in terms of the carbon emissions that mm -hmm. you're going to have. So here in Ontario, you could have a nuclear-powered car. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you may call it that way. <laughs> now, what about the, um, the charging stations themselves? Uh, how can we make sure that they're green? Or where, where are they going to get their charge from? Well, they get their power from the electricity grid, so the generation impacts them. But there is a possibility that uh, they could be solar powered totally. Uh, in that case, yes, they would be 100% green. But uh, would they have enough charge for fast charging? And even with that, wouldn't the generation of solar panels have any carbon emissions and things like that? So having a zero, absolute zero emission is quite hard. Mm -hmm. I, I guess if we have, um, if we have a, a solar array or windmills there and then a, a station, would that be totally clean all the way around? Uh, it's hard to say because the production of uh, solar cells, the production of everything incurs carbon emissions. So if you're looking for an absolute zero, that's hard. But if we are talking about low emissions, yeah, that would be a yes. So do you think... Uh, We'll ever get to a stage where we could say that all electric cars are zero emission? Um, well, again, it's debatable. I mean, I wouldn't go for zero. Maybe low emission would be the more correct uh, way of saying it. How far do we have to go to do that? What would we need to do to make cars zero emission? Uh, there's lots into it. The production of the cars, the production of the electrical electricity generation facilities, both including how uh, and where they get their power from, solar, hydro, yes, they are good, certainly. But then how do you produce the elements that uh, make these generations come uh, to life? That's another thing. And with all that, uh, it is doable, I believe, but we're still not there. 
that's that that would be the correct answer. One suggestion has been to make your house a generating station so that you have your own solar panels on the roof and a windmill in your backyard to charge your car when you're not using it and maybe so that our electricity isn't coming from big stations like we have now, but everybody's generating electricity. Mm -hmm. Would that work as a model? Mm -hmm. that, that would be beneficial, uh, and that would also reduce the losses on the transmission system, which, is, uh, which also incurs the uh, generation of electricity. So we have to produce a lot of electricity because it's coming from further away places, and the reason is it's being lost in the transmission lines. If we generate at home, it's local, it's closer to us, to us so the uh, losses are less, uh, but still, <laughs> I cannot say zero. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Kantarshi, thank you very much for your time. You're okay, well, uh, we've kept you waiting long enough. It's time to open up the Facebook floodgates and let questions come pouring through. Now, let's take our first question, but it's not showing up on my pad here. So we have to take a little, okay. Being a um, technical Luddite, even though I'm Mr. Science. Okay, our first question from Facebook is, why do octopuses, octopuses, octopi, why do they have eight legs? Why do they have eight legs? Anyone want to, who, who would like to answer that? We've stumped the panel. <laughs> when you think about it, most creatures on Earth either walk on four, six, or eight legs. We are the odd ones out walking on only two. There's ourselves and birds, that's about it. So why do they have eight legs? I don't know. Because they can? <laughs> That's why we call them octopuses. Yes, indeed. Uh, OK, well, that was a great <laughs> response. Our Facebook experience is re our experiment is working really well here so far. Uh, any suggestions, Nick? See, this is the beauty of doing things for the first time. Uh, this is another Facebook question. Uh, it's related to climate change. And how could climate change actually improve agriculture in the north? How could climate change improve agriculture? OK, well, I'll take a stab at that. Um, it, it could. Uh, you know, they have longer growing seasons. And it could, uh, and there'll be more rain, probably. There's more precipitation. Uh, so it, it might extend agriculture um, further north, but there's also the possibility of more variable weather too. So in, in a future climate, not necessarily having um, as stable a, a summer and a growing season. So that, that's, a, that's a, a, a possible deal breaker, I don't know. Okay, but it's more than the climate. You can say, okay, it's gonna get warm up here, there's a nice growing season, but what about soils? Oh yeah. Can so the ground can the ground do that? Can the ground adapt? The the ground would have to adapt because the, the soils are are, are impoverished uh, in in certain places, and so it would have to have uh, soil development. So it wouldn't necessarily have to happen uh, right away. So it would take time for that to happen, or yeah, we'd have to bring yeah. soil or up. Or bring soil up, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I know that on the prairies now they're uh, they're actually enjoying climate change because they're getting extra growing seasons and they're getting extra crops. So it's actually helping in a way. If only the water holds out. That's the that's the tip, that's yeah. the big issue. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Okay, this is a physics question. 
How does a curling rock curl? How does a curling rock actually be able to work and make a curve? You are a physicist? <laughs> I'm an astronomer. <laughs> they are different things. No, um, I'll give it a shot. It has to do with friction um, there, and the surface of the ice. Being a good Canadian, I know how they make curling ice. Um, it's ha there's this speckled surface, right? They they put this speckled surface out, and it so it's like lumpy, which it provides a friction. And as it spins, um, the side that's spinning with or in this in a certain direction uh, creates friction in a different way than on the other side, going with the motion or against the motion. So <laughs> it has to do with the friction. Um, one side gets friction differently than the other, and then that makes it move. But that's as best as I can do with that, I think. <laughs> Well, I looked into this a little myself, and I thought there's, there's something odd about curling stones, because if you take any round object and you rotate it, and you push the front edge of it down, like let's suppose it's rotating towards the left, it'll roll to the right, correct? That's what it'll do. It'll roll in the opposite direction to which it's turning, whereas curling stones go in the direction they're curling. They're, they're backwards. They go the other way. I think also in, in, in the air, like when you have a ball, like a, like a volleyball, if it has a spin, if it has a down spin, it's going to go down. Right? Yeah. Just like a curling stone? Yeah. <laughs> What about making water and making, you know, it's a little slippery on this. You say it's swirling the water around towards its curled side, which would make it slipperier on that side, make it curl that I way. want to go back to quantum fluctuations. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> okay, here comes, a, here comes a really easy question uh, from six-year-old Tyler. We find that children give us the, uh, the really easy questions. How did life on Earth start? That's an easy one. Of all the mysteries in the universe, how did life on Earth start? Anyone want to take it? Okay. Want to take it? Extremely tough. Oh, okay, go ahead. That is that is um, an extremely tough question. There are a lot of people working on this problem, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, it it <laughs> seemed. It has been recreated in the lab a few times that um, complex molecules um, that resemble DNA. Can, can be constructed with, with electricity and, um, and basic building blocks. But uh, that's about all I can remember. It's been a while well, since I've thought about this. Yeah, they could, they could make the chemistry, but nothing has crawled out of a test tube yet and say, I'm here. Yeah. We haven't had the blob yet, right? No. So what's the boundary then between chemistry and biology? Uh, replication is the name of the game here. Um, so as soon as something could make copies of itself, you could consider it to be, uh, to be life. But there really is no strict boundary. Okay. So what happened here, obviously, we had the right chemistry, we had the energy, we had lightning and electricity and heat and all these chemicals. What, what's your thought on having it happen on other worlds? Yeah, well, it would take the, um, obviously, exactly the right uh, combination of of things altogether, and you know I can't speculate <laughs> on what the chances would be. Um, maybe it's it's possible that that other combinations could also work under different circumstances, but um, it's it's impossible to know um, uh, you know what is what is not possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? That that's a, a roundabout way of saying I have no idea. Once again, scientists don't know. I, I do like that possibility that uh, our life is based on carbon. That's what happened here. But you could have another molecule like silicon at the base, which would make them rocks, living rocks. So maybe Mars is covered with life. We just don't recognize it. Just look around and say, oh, there's just a bunch of rocks there. Yeah, or you, or Meanwhile, all the rocks are going. <laughs> <laughs> they think we're not moving. Ah. Okay, um, Tommy, who was seven years old, asked, this is another really easy question, how much does the Earth weigh? 
How much does the Earth weigh? I, that's me. You're the yeah. astronomer, yeah? Um, I, can't, I can't remember. I feel like I, this is something I should know. <laughs> uh, it's something ridiculous. Uh, it's like 10 to the 24, 10 to the 26 kilograms, or something along those lines. I think it's 10 to the 24. Picture a number, um, like go up to a, a, a whiteboard and write a one, and then write 24 zeros after it. It's that many kilograms. OK. So that's, I, that's a lot. OK. That, now, that is the Earth's mass. Oh. The question is, how much does the Earth weigh? And I have an answer to that. <laughs> the Earth weighs nothing because it's floating in space. <laughs> okay, that Another question from Facebook. Where does an electric eel get its electricity? An electric eel get its electricity. Any of our biologists here? No? You have an idea? I have an idea on they can, so they're special sensors. So fish have, similar to the type of cells we have in our ears for hearing. So there's hair cells that, are, sorry, I'm the mic. There's hair cells that can receive electric currents. And I think it's adapted to that, that same system that can actually emit, emit the electric currents. And so it can be used for things like detecting, detecting prey and those kind of things in terms of electri emitting the electricity and it bouncing back. So you're saying their nerves can go both directions, in yeah. and out? The, the signaling can go both directions, yes. Wow. So in actually sharks, that's how they use it to find prey on the bottom of the floor. They actually emit electric currents and then use that to detect then how, yeah, and detect the, yeah. Do you know how much yeah. electricity? I'm really putting you on the spot here. Do you yeah. know how much electricity and electricity? Less than 10 to the 24. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be it'd be probably pretty minute because we have sensitivity. So that's in terms of what I say we we're not electric eels, but in terms of vertebrates and ha and the changes in membrane potential they can respond to, it can be very small. It okay. Can be only a scale of millivolts. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Christina asks, uh, we were t talking about dreams earlier, how are hallucinations different from dreams, or are they? Hallucinations and dreams. Hmm. Wow, I'm, I'm very glad somebody asked this, because my field of research is actually hallucinations. Um, so dreams and hallucinations are very similar in that they're both, they both can be um, sensory experiences, and they're both um, unconsciously brought on. So they have a lot of the same characteristics, but they differ in the sense that hallucinations are not um, necessarily naturally occurring. So dreams occur more frequently and um, more commonly because we have these brain pathways and these systems that, um, that help us to dream. Um, but hallucinations actually come from completely different cognitive mechanisms. Um, so there are types of hallucinations that come from dream retrieval. So the, um, the you know, bringing up or, or bringing forward of a dream experience. Um, but it's, it's perceptually different and they have different um, base cognitive mechanisms. So you're saying there's a different, there's a different circuitry in the brain for hallucinations exactly. than there are for dream. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Which is different from the way we think every day. Exactly, yes. Wow. There's a saying that um, if the brain has five ways to do things, it'll do them all ten. So that's a very, very <laughs> good analogy for this. Wow. Um, when you say hallucinations now, are you talking about the kind that could be induced artificially with drugs or are um, there natural hallucinations? Um, there are natural hallucinations. So I'm currently in the middle of a book that is a um, encyclopedia of hallucinations that's 560 pages long and it documents different hallucinations. So if you can imagine the size of that book, that's how many hallucinations there are. Um, but the cognitive mechanisms that underlie the hallucination, so not actually what you hallucinate or the cause of it, how your brain actually gives you the ability to hallucinate, that can differ as well uh, based on the different type of hallucination that can happen. So drugs are only one little part of the types of hallucinations that we can experience. But what about trying to treat them? Um, it depends on the cause. So that is more of a um, neuroscientific basis. Um, there are different drugs that can inhibit hallucinations. Um, 
but it, it really varies based on what causes the hallucination. Okay, thank you very much, Leo. Okay, here's one that I think about quite a lot because I spend a lot of time in the air. Um, question is, uh, how do heavy planes fly? I know there are times, you know, you get on these big jumbo jets and you think, this is too big to get off the ground. How can this thing actually do it? So, how do really heavy airplanes fly? What, do you, do you want? Magic. I don't like that answer at all. So, <laughs> there is, it's a combination of two things. Um, uh, shape of wing is important, and, and we, we learn that this is sort of the one you learn when you're in, in grade school, um, or perhaps the one that's a little bit misconstrued. Uh, uh, but the shape of the wing matters, and the way the, the wind goes over the wing matters. Um, you, there's a, a downdraft that's being created, and, and, speed, and the speed of the wind matters because um, that affects a, a force called lift. But, there's a saying in airplane making, and that is uh, a little higher. There's a saying, and that's you can get a barn door to fly if you attach a big enough motor to it, right? And that is because the downdraft, which is actually based on the uh, Newton's third law, which is action-reaction, that if you get wind to hit the bottom of, the, of the, the wing hard enough, it'll push back hard enough and go up. So there's a, an action-reaction of, of a wing hitting the wind along with the shape of the wing that makes all of it work. Okay, that's basic aerodynamics. All airplanes use that. But then you get up to super scale, the really big ones. How are they getting away with it? Or is it the same for any, doesn't matter what size you are? Well, I mean, yeah, it's the same idea. It all scales up, yeah. Just have a whole lot of power. Uh, again, astronomer, so, you know. <laughs> airplanes don't work in space. No. <laughs> no. I've always thought if I could travel back in time, the one person that I would like to bring to one of our international airports is Leonardo da Vinci, because he dreamt of flight. He studied birds, he made beautiful drawings, and he made little machines like an ornithopter that was powered by humans, a helicopter that was powered by humans, but none of them ever flew. And to take him to today and just let him watch a jumbo jet take off, and then put him back in time. So you're looking just, just, just leave them with that. Okay, well, I think that's all of our questions from Facebook. Thank you to all your Facebook uh, watchers out there today for your great questions. <laughs> oh, we do. No, we don't. I uh, don't see any more questions. Oh, I thought that was it. Hoo -hoo. Okay, sorry, we do have another question. This is really interesting. Um, could we use genetically modified organisms to actually absorb more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Could we use genetic engineering to try to reduce climate change? Hmm, interesting. Dr. Hall, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I could talk about that a little bit, I think. Um, I think the idea here is that plants, because they photosynthesize, can capture carbon. And so if we were able to genetically modify plants that were able to capture more carbon, or to be able to sustain a bigger plant, for example, that might be one way that you would be able to to use plants to help to help with the carbon dioxide problem of climate change. So, do you think that's a good idea? Uh, I'm not sure. I would say that necessarily because I think in terms of scale, there's already plants that grow pretty well. But in terms of scale, you would really, really have to scale up to be able to. Um, be able to absorb enough and capture enough of the carbon with plants. And the other side of that is that when plants die, if they start to, um, to when, once they die in a forest or something like that, they start to decompose. And part of the decomposing process actually re-releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So it's a balance act there. So personally, I don't think it's a necessarily great um, solution to that. But uh, I do think that it could be something I mean, 
The question is, could it be used? Technically, it could be, but I'm not sure how feasible it actually would be for a long-term solution. This question comes up in geoengineering, where we try to come up with ways to compensate for carbon dioxide, uh, either through genetic engineering or spraying particles in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight, when really it comes down to stop putting the carbon in the atmosphere in the first place. <laughs> that's, that's the better solution. Okay. 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 Okay, this is about, uh, this is a sort of a chemistry question. Hydrogen fuel cells, how are they different from batteries? How are hydrogen fuel cells different from batteries? Uh, well, they have, yeah, uh, they have working, uh, different working principles. Uh, they're not uh, made from lithium ion batteries like the, uh, most of the electric vehicles that we have today. Um, and they're fueled uh, with uh, different type of fuels. Uh, so they're, um, I guess the question is also related with their emissions. That would be different uh, from a lithium ion battery uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So the, but again, the, the difference, um, I've heard of it as a battery is a container, whatever you put in it, that's all it's got. Whereas a fuel cell, the fuel's on the outside and it's going through mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. it, but it uh, still, still works in a similar principle. Uh, that's right. I mean, um, so there is this combustion engine vehicles, uh, which are our gasoline-based vehicles. That's one thing. Then there is the uh, fuel cell-based cars. That's, um, well, there's a whole lot of research going into that. And uh, there is a consideration whether they could be the mainstream cars instead of the lithium-ion battery cars. Uh, and yes, they need to be fueled as well. Um, so we can uh, consider, well, that's sort of an advantage and disadvantage for them. If you're vehicle, uh, fueling a vehicle, uh, that means you're also taking less time than doing it with electrical charging. So that's mostly where the advantage comes from. Um, but yeah, there, there is lots of uh, things going around with either this one or that one. Well, I know one of the problems with fuel cells is that if they run on hydrogen, where do you get the hydrogen? Well, if we run out of lithium-ion battery reserves, where do we get that? <laughs> right? I mean, there's always this problem. Where of do you get the lithium-ion? Yeah, I know <laughs> there, that. There's, there's always the supply yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we have to make hydrogen. Mm -hmm. It takes energy to make hydrogen. You don't drill it out of the ground. It's not free. You have to make it, and that takes oh. energy. So drilling from the ground takes energy too. <laughs> <laughs> right if you drill now. gas out, you can get it out of the gas, but it still takes energy to make hydrogen. Mm -hmm. We don't. Yeah. It's not yeah. as natural. Thank you very much. That's right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, this one's uh, nine-year-old James is asking, <laughs> how do submarines not sink? Actually, they do sink. They just come back up again. But uh, so how do, submarine <laughs> how do submarines not sink? I think this is a fairly fundamental question. Anyone want to take it? OK, I'll answer it. <laughs> hey. So they have ballast tanks. They have these empty tanks that are around the side. You got the body of the submarine where all the people are, looks like a sausage, but then on the outside of that is another couple of tubes and they can fill them with either air or water. And if they fill them with enough air, then they'll have buoyancy and they'll float, but if they flood those tanks with water, the buoyancy goes down and it sinks. And so they're always managing the amount of air versus water in these tanks compared to the weight of the sub. So that's how they can float or sink ballast tanks. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm into sailing and, and there's, a, there's a saying in sailing, the best tool to keep a sinking boat afloat is a scared man with a bucket. <laughs> Highly motivated. Another question. What are the three most important things we can do to reduce our ecological footprints? The three big things we could do to, re to stop our ecological footprint. What is it, uh, they're saying that the amount of energy and the amount of land each of us takes here in our developed world, if everybody in the world did that, we'd need four planets, three or four planets, I think, the, the amount we're consuming. So what can we do to reduce that ecological footprint? Yep, okay. 
I can provide, there we go, I can provide one if other folks on the panel can add to mine. Um, one thing we can actually do is eat less meat, believe it or not. Um, so if we actually reduce the amount of meat that we consume, because uh, consuming meat means that we have to raise those animals and it turns out that that sort of farming requires lots and lots of water and land and resources to raise these, these animals simply that, so that we can consume them and even though they may be delicious, uh, we really should think about reducing the quantity of meat that we actually consume and find our proteins in other sources. And that way, it's a really easy, quick way to reduce your carbon footprint. Okay. So there's one. That's one. one. Any more? Um, I won't take the low-hanging fruit there, but I'll, uh, I'll say that you could wear a sweater indoors in the winter and try to keep your temperature a little bit lower so that you don't have to use as much uh, electricity or other ways of heating to heat. And similarly, you could not use as much air conditioning in the summer. So lighting, heating, and cooling is a big use for our natural resources. Okay, reduce your energy input consumption, right? Okay. And I would invite Google, Amazon, and all big companies in the world to place their, uh, uh, their computational center in Canada in the north, where we don't need uh, coolers by, because our weather will cool them. <laughs> Okay. Anyone else want to wait in? Take it from the other side there. We'll go beyond three. So I would say transportation is a big one. So less flying um, in big, big airplanes, um, <laughs> uh, biking uh, to get places, walking to get places, and if, if not that, then the bus. So right. oh, that'll do, do a lot. Now that might also involve redesigning our cities and our urban centers so that you can walk and bicycle to places rather than having to take a car. And that's right. Just yeah. Urban design involved there. And they need um, a bike racks out front here. Yeah. Heads up. Okay. Okay. Here's here's one um, biological question. Why do men have beards and women don't? Why do men have beers? Go ahead. So a lot of that is hormone driven. So we know that testosterone, men have it more. It's not that women don't have testosterone, women do too, but at a much lower ratio compared to estrogen. And so with uh, testosterone, there is more body hair that comes, so not just facial, but also at the level of the chest. Some people have it at the back and, and so on. And so testosterone plays an important role. Um, and we'll see that also that for women who tend to show a lot of hair loss, have problems with hair loss, often this is due to lower levels of, of testosterone, which can be remedied depending on the actual cause with uh, potential hormone replacement. Okay. It's all about the hormones. It's all about the hormones. Uh, here's a physics question. Um, why do we have to pour cold water over food to thaw it out and not warm water? I've never done that, but I, <laughs> I just let it sit on the counter myself. But uh, OK, so why is cold water better at thawing food than warm water? We have an answer? Yeah, go for it. We, we, okay, we need to get you a mic. Hang on, we'll, we'll get you a microphone. Okay, this is coming from an audience. We have the smartest audience in radio. <laughs> I mean that. Uh, my name's Lucas White, and I'm from here in Ottawa. Uh, the reason why cold water works for thawing things out is that it actually has more heat energy than the air around it. So because there's more molecules in the water, it actually holds more heat and is able to thaw the meat out faster. You mean the hot water is already hot, so it can't absorb more? Well, no, the cold water yeah, the has cold more energy than the air. So if you leave the meat out on the counter, it's surrounded by less molecules than if it's in the cold water. Oh, I get that. But why cold water instead of hot water? Oh, well, the hot water will thaw it out too quickly. And so the outside of the meat will be cooked, basically, before the inside of the meat. Ah, so it's trying to bring it up gradually. Yeah, so you want to do it slowly. slowly. Ah. 
Good, good. Thank you very much for can, the answer. Can I actually Lovely. answer? <laughs> well, I have the mic. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Can I actually answer a earlier question about the uh, curling rock? The curling rocks, yes. The, the curling rock. So the reason why a curling rock curls it has to do with friction. Uh, so what's happening is if you think about the curling rock as it's turning, as someone who's holding a broom and he's turning, if his friend behind him grabs onto that uh, broomstick, he's going to want to go in the same direction that he's rotating that broomstick. So what's happening is the curling rock on the front side, the layer of water between the curling stone and the ice is warmer than the water on the back side, and that's causing drag on the curling rock, which is slowing it down on the back of the curling rock, which is turning it in the direction that it's curling. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. We have one question. This will be our last Facebook question. And again, thank you to everyone who wrote in. Is it true that protons can sometimes escape black holes? Mr. Astronomer. <laughs> I'm going to get this one wrong, too. Um, it's not, so yeah, black holes are not black, they're gray. Um, they, it's true, they're gray holes, they do radiate. Um, Hawking was, was the one who put this forward. Um, uh, the radiation is, the, what, the way it works is uh, right at the, the boundary where you have, you need an infinite amount of energy to get away, right at that event horizon, the, the Schwarzschild radius. Um, this quantum, these quantum fluctuations, um, well, we're back to that again. We're back to that. Um, they're happening. They're happening all around that, that surface, right? So that surface is there. Um, and when, when these little uh, quantum fluctuations happen, you can get these virtual particles that pop into existence. And you get one particle and one antiparticle. That, and they're virtual, so they're not real particles technically. Um, but it's true. This, these are, this is all real science words, people. Um, <laughs> so. We're back to the hallucinations. <laughs> Um, so, if you um, if you if that happens right at the boundary, it's possible that the one of the part one of these virtual particles can fall into the black hole and disappear, and then one will radiate away, stealing some of the energy from the black hole, which will m make it evaporate eventually. But the time scale that this happens on is like much longer than the age of the universe so far. So, um, it's black holes do radiate, um, just in a very weird way. So it, it can happen, just not very often. And it has to happen right at the event horizon. Exactly. That's the point of no return. You go over the event horizon, you don't come back. And so if it happens right on the board, on the fence, in other words. You get two particles, one falls in, one falls out. Absolutely. OK. Thank you very much. We got that. <laughs> you. OK. So we're just going to do our closing theme. We'll end the show. And that'll be it. Thank you. Uh, we're not hearing it here, Nick. Well, that's all the time we have today. Video of this event will be available soon on our website. That's at cbc.ca slash quirks. And we've got a lot of people to thank. First, give it up for all of our experts who gave us their time. And thanks to all of you who sent in questions online. Sorry that we just couldn't get all of it in. We do answer questions every week in our show, so we'll try and answer some of them on air on future programs. A big thanks to all of the staff and volunteers here at the new Canada Science and Technology Museum in Ottawa. This show was produced by Mark Crawley. We couldn't have done the event without technical and digital support from Serge Brunette, Natasha Ramardine, and Olsi Suraka. Quirks and Quarks executive producer is Nick McCabe-Locos, and I'm Bob McDonald. Thanks for listening.